when Jesus passed by. All right. Well, go to take your Bible tonight, Matthew chapter 10, if you would please. Matthew chapter 10. And good to have the South Carolina girls back, right? Jeanette's there. Didn't I see Diane back there? She disappeared? Okay. Is Mary Lou here somewhere? She's here. There she is, right there. Okay. And uh, glad they're back safely from their time in South Carolina. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. When he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Provide neither gold, nor silver, nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, Inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And when ye come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it not be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here tonight. And Lord, as we look at this passage and we consider the advice that you gave to these twelve whom you sent out, you commanded them, and you told them to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And Lord, we understand that you too have commissioned us and you've sent us out. And Lord, as we are sent, we want to understand what you meant when you said be wise as serpents and yet harmless as doves. So open our understanding tonight. Help us to glean the truth from your word that will help us to be effective servants of thine. Bless our study this evening, please, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. One of the things that Jesus is getting across to the men as they're preparing to go out to preach the gospel and to preach the kingdom of heaven is that some are going to accept your message and some aren't. He said you might as well be prepared for that. And uh, that's kind of the summary of the verses that we read. Do you know, uh, have you gotten the news flash? Not everybody wants to hear about Jesus. <laughs> uh, if you've ever gone out to witness, ever gone out to knock on doors, and uh, ever go out uh, to, to try to talk to folks about Jesus, you find that not everybody wants to hear about him. And, of course, there's different reasons for that. Uh, some people don't think they need to be saved. Uh, some people think they're, they're fine already. And uh, you try to tell them about uh, uh, a savior they need they don't think they need to be saved or they think they're not bad enough to really go to hell uh, if there is a hell they're certainly not bad enough to go there after all they're a pretty good person uh, they don't beat their wife or kick their dog or anything like that and so they think they're good enough to go to heaven uh, some feel like they've been mistreated or maybe burned by Christians and so they don't want anything to do with Christianity uh, because they uh, met some bad Christians, so to speak, uh, in their life. Others have their own religion. 
Maybe they're Muslim, maybe they're Buddhist, maybe they're some other faith and they're perfectly content in their faith and their confidence is in that and so they really don't want to hear about Jesus, don't want anything to do with him. But whatever the reason it is that folks don't want to hear, there were folks like that in Jesus' day too. Things haven't changed, okay? Uh, they don't, don't think, sometimes it's always easy for us to think, well, it was a lot easier back then. Uh, but those people back then thought it was a lot easier back before them. And uh, it's just kind of the way it always works. Uh, but it's always been the same. Some will hear and some will not want to hear. There's those who uh, want to know about Christ and those who don't want to know about Christ. And what he's telling uh, the disciples here is work with those who want to hear and walk away from those who don't want to hear. Uh, don't, don't, uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, you, you, you don't have to get upset if people don't want to hear about Jesus. You keep going because there are some who do. I remember when I was uh, young, we, we planted a church, and I would, go, I would look at a neighborhood, and there'd be 50 homes in that neighborhood, and, and I, I would never get discouraged over the no's or the no answers because I always figured there's somebody in this neighborhood who wants to hear about Jesus. And so I just kept knocking all the doors until I got to the one who wanted to hear about Jesus. And inevitably, somebody in the neighborhood wanted to hear about Jesus. And, and if you just be persistent and keep going, you'll find the one who wants to hear about Christ. All right? So in the context of some are going to listen, some are not going to listen. Those who listen, you give the gospel to. Those who don't, Jesus said, you can shake the dust off your feet. Um, it's those in that context of those who would reject. And by the way, God says when they reject, my judgment will be upon them. My judgment will be upon them. Because remember, they're not rejecting us. They're rejecting him. Okay? Don't take that personally. They're rejecting the Lord Jesus. And, and God says the judgment will be upon them. He said, so behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. That's not a really good picture, is it? Uh, sheep, as we, we talked about sheep uh, Sunday evening, they're, they're pretty defenseless animals. And God is saying, uh, and by the way, we also said sheep aren't real intelligent, okay? And, and by the way, to send the sheep towards the wolves and not away from the wolves doesn't seem real smart either, does it? Because we're not very, you know, they're, they're not, you don't see the sheep taking on the wolf. And, uh, and the wolf will tear the sheep up, and that's exactly what the Lord says. But he's saying, as you go out there, now listen, you're going out as a sheep, but here's what you're going to do. You're going to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Okay? What does that mean? What does that mean? Number one, what does that mean? Wise means thoughtful. Wise means discreet. Wise means cautious. So he's not focusing here on the wiles or the ways of the serpent. He's focusing on the wisdom of the serpent. You know, they say no creature has the sense to escape trouble quicker than the snake. So Jesus isn't suggesting that we be wicked in our conduct like the serpent, but that we be wise in caution like the serpent. What he's saying is, don't be reckless. Be aware of your situation and what's going on. Did you know sometimes your excitement and your zeal for God can get you in trouble? Hmm? I remember, in, 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 in sometimes in your zeal for Christ, and some of you may have been this way when you first got saved, in your zeal for Christ, you really push some people further away from the Lord than you did drawing them closer to the Lord. I remember one year, we, I, I, one year here, I got a call from the Catholic Church down the road because somebody, when we were passing out flyers for one of our big days, somebody flyered the Catholic Church parking lot with cars. Yeah, that's real funny. Uh, the, the priest didn't think it was so funny, and uh, he called me to let me know he didn't appreciate it very much. But uh, that, was, uh, that, that was somebody's zeal. And by the way, I, I don't mind that zeal, by the way. But uh, we... <laughs> We can do things and present the gospel in such a way that it can alienate people and push them away from the Lord rather than draw them to the Lord. Um, uh, an example of that, we were 
uh, I was pastoring a church, and I had a fella uh, who had graduated from a Bible institute, and uh, they moved the area, and he was really, really big on, on uh, he wanted to go uh, call street preaching, but he didn't want to do it on the street. He wanted to do it on the campus of a college. And uh, so he kept bugging me to go with him, bugging me to go with him, and so I said, all right, all right, I'll go with you. And so I went with him, and uh, we walked onto the campus, and he stood up on a planter. And, and how many of you ever been out with somebody street preaching? Anybody been out there? Okay, he stood up on the planter, and, and he opened his Bible up, and here's what you do. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, lift up your voice and show my people their transgressions. That's what you do. And you just keep on going at that, at that rate. And you're letting them know. And then he went on to list the transgressions of everybody on campus, I think. And I stood there for a while. I was behind him and I was watching him. And I was observing people. You know what I saw? I saw people went, and took the long way around. And, and he just kept going. And, and I just slipped away. And they, they had these big planters where, where it was concrete. And, you know, uh, trees in the middle or, you know, green stuff. And then they had, like, it would, a place you could sit all the way around in a circular thing. And I just walked around the corner down there. And I saw some guy sitting there. I sat down beside him. Introduced myself to him. And he was an 18-year-old freshman from Pennsylvania. We chatted a little bit, didn't go to church anywhere, hadn't been in church growing up. Asked him if he knew if he died, he'd go to heaven. I said, no. Asked him if I could take the Bible and show him how he could know for sure if he died, he'd go to heaven. He said, I'd like to see that. And sat down on the planter there and shared the plan of salvation with him. And he bowed his head and asked Christ to be his Savior. Okay? And just got done and was giving him assurance of salvation and giving him some information about the church. And, and, and I see out of a corner of my eye, I hear this guy. He's talking loud, and he's talking loud to two campus policemen. Because they had come. He was, where the, the place he had picked to preach and to, to, you know, raise his voice was the, the planter that is outside the library. And people in the library had called the police saying they could hear this guy in the library, and it was disturbing them. So they were ushering him off campus, saying, you're not allowed to do that here tonight. Now, here's the, here's the thing. I'm, I, I'm not opposed to guys preaching like he did. I'm not, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm saying you might alienate more by doing that than you will by drawing people that way. I still think personal witnessing is the best way to do that. You know, you've, uh, and, and again, certain it, it probably does more. That kind of standing on the street corner uh, and preaching or putting a sandwich sign on your board and, you know, preaching that probably does more for you and your boldness than it does for anybody listening. And I'll tell you, most of you guys, if you, if you went downtown and you heard somebody hollering and screaming on the sidewalk, you'd have probably looked at them and said, what kind of nut is that? Am I right? Huh? You've thought that before. Or you wonder, what, what is he yelling about or screaming about? And, and you wonder. And so there's a, there's a, I think there's a way to go about it. And that's what the Lord is saying. Be wise in what you're doing. Be, uh, uh, temper, temper your zeal with knowledge. Okay? And, and be able to have both. And exercising caution can save a follower of Jesus unnecessary hassles in bringing the message to other people. And you don't have to invite those hassles in die the way you do it. Had a fellow one time and a and, uh, college student who had I had taken out soul winning. And I remember he had, we had gone together for a little bit and then he decided, well, we'll finish this street out and I'll, I'll take this side, the last three houses, you take that side. And I finished those houses up and I looked over and he was at the last house. And I, I saw him, the lady had a screen door and I saw him stand there, he had his New Testament out and I saw his finger going like this at the lady. And I, and I just said, oh. Again, 
and, and, I, and I talked to him afterwards. He, he came back and said, man, I think she was really under conviction. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, I think she wanted to get rid of you. But, you know, here again, we're not going there. We're going there to preach Jesus Christ. We're going there to present Christ. And if they want to hear, I want to tell them about Jesus. And if they don't want to hear, I'm not going to, you say, you know, when they open the door, put your foot right there, you know. So they can't close the door. They close it on your foot. You know what I mean? That isn't what Jesus said. He said, don't invite the unnecessary hassles. Uh, be wise as serpents. Okay? Be, use, use some intelligence. Okay? And, and he's talking with the sheep here going among the wolves. He's not necessarily talking about their stupidity as he is their vulnerability. They're vulnerable. They have no way to fight back. And, and that's what he told the servants of the Lord. He said in Timothy, Paul told Timothy, the servant of the Lord must not strive. We're not, we're not going out there to argue. We're not going out there to fight. I'm never, I, I don't argue. What, what, say, what are you doing knocking the door and it, someone's Jehovah's Witness or someone's some other, and, and or they're Mormon and they want to argue with you. You know what? I'm not arguing with you. I'll give them a track and move on. Why? There's someone else down there. I've had that happen passing out flyers for the big day. We're running into Mormon missionaries. They stop you. And they want to engage in conversation. Well, I'm not out there to engage them in conversation. I'm out there to get the flyers out for the big day we're having. And if the devil can keep me from getting to that house five doors down because somebody wants to hear about Jesus, he'll throw a couple Mormon missionaries in my path to distract me for an hour, and then I won't get to that person down there. And so you, you, you have to be wise as serpent and harmless as a dove. Now, harmless as a dove, harmless means unmixed, unalloyed, guileless. It means to be sincere. Okay? It means to be pure. It's, it's a word harmless means to be transparent. The dove in the Bible, as you know, is a symbol of innocence. They're harmless creatures. So, with the serpent, the Lord would have us to be cautious. And with the dove, He would have us to be kind. Always be kind. How many understand? Uh, how many of you, as far as you know, you accepted Christ the very first time anybody ever witnessed to you? The very first time you ever heard the gospel, you believed it and got saved. Anybody like that? As far as you know, the very first time. All right. How many of you, it took two, two times or more until you got saved? Okay, that's most people, isn't it? Now, what if, you understand? So if you knock on someone's door, or you witness to a coworker, or a neighbor, or a friend, and they don't get saved, would you still be kind to them? Because it'll probably be someone else who's going to get to win them to Christ. But they could still be saved. But I want to leave, I, I, want, to, I want them to leave saying, well, I didn't accept what they were trying to get me to do, but you know what? They still were nice to me. And, and the next time somebody knocks on their door, the next time somebody wants to talk to them about Jesus, they'll say, well, I think I'll listen. You want to you be able to leave the door open for the next person coming after you. Because most people, it's going to take more than one time for them to be saved. Okay? So be kind in bringing the message. That's what the harmless as a dove would mean. Now, the merging of those two phrases together. Wise as serpent, Harmless as dove. The merging of the two phrases. It's, it's quite a combination. It's kind of like steel and velvet. It's, it's like blue denim and lace. It's like grace and truth. Honor and majesty. That's the balance we're to desire. We need truth, but we need grace also. We need toughness, but we need tenderness. You have to have both. I think the I think the fella who I was uh, the, who was preaching on the planner, I, I think he had truth, but I think he needed some tenderness to go along with it. I I remember when I was a teenager, uh, again it was a street situation with the church we were in, Camp Baptist Temple, and. They would go down, and, and somebody, uh, it was right where all the people got on the buses in downtown Canton, Ohio. And Saturday afternoon, they go down there, and 
And they had a fellow who could sing really well, a loud voice, and he just starts singing. And, and people would gather around because they, they liked to hear a good song. And, and then when he was done, people would approach the ones who were standing there and give them, give them a track and try to talk to him about the Lord. And I literally, literally, I saw a guy when one guy said no and he took the track and threw it down and said, I don't want to hear about it. As he walked away, I watched that Christian go like this. He didn't kick him, but he looked like that's what he wanted to do. Oh, don't do that. You see, don't, 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 don't. Keep, keep the kindness. Keep the grace as well as the truth. It is easy to select one and neglect the other. Everybody knows somebody who's got all the truth, but they don't have any grace. But we can't have all grace and no truth. There are the, the liberal churches that are just, well, we're open minds and open hearts, and whatever you believe, you just come with us. Well, that sounds real nice and real pretty, but you've got to have truth somewhere. So you, you've got to have the grace and you've got to have the truth. You've got to have both. That's the wisdom of the serpent to escape the area of danger and the harmlessness of the dove not to hurt others while you do it. That's, that's wise as serpent, harmless as dove. This is a dilemma that faces anybody who's ever witnessed. When do you flee danger and when do you embrace it and witness through it? In 1684, John Bunyan, not Paul and the guy with the axe, okay? This is John Bunyan who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, okay? Have you, how many of you know Pilgrim's Progress when I say that? Okay, quite a few of you do. Great, great book. He wrote another book in 1684 called Seasonable Counsels or Advice to Sufferers. And he addressed this question, when does a sufferer fly from danger and when does he stand and suffer danger? Now, Bunyan knew what that meant for him. John Bunyan had four children. One of them was blind. And he chose to remain in prison for 12 years rather than promise not to preach the gospel. They, they would bring his fine little daughter down to the prison with his wife and say, uh, and, 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 and they would coax her to plead her daddy out of jail. Say, John, get out. You want to see your daughter? Come on. You want to go home to your family? All you have to do is promise when we let you out, you'll not preach about Jesus Christ. You'll not preach the gospel. And John Bunyan would say, if you let me out of jail today, I'll be preaching Christ tomorrow. And he kept him in jail for 12 years. So he answered that question for himself, but how did he answer for others? He asked the question, may we try to escape? And he said, thou mayest do in this as it is in thy heart. If it's in thy heart to fly, then fly. If it be in thy heart to stand, then stand. Anything but a denial of the truth. He that flies has warrant to, and has warrant to do so. He that stands would have warrant to do so. In fact, the same man may both fly and stand as the call and working of God with his heart may be. Moses fled in Exodus 2 and verse 15, but then he stood in according to Hebrews 11 and 27 and took his stand with the people of God. David fled, but David also stood. Jeremiah fled, but Jeremiah also stood. Uh, we'll look at a couple examples of Christ here in a moment. Paul fled, and Paul also stood. You'll find that, that there were times that he fled the persecution, and other times he stood against the persecution. He wrote, Bunyan wrote, This man himself is best able to judge concerning his present strength, and what weight this or that argument has upon his heart to stand or fly. He said, don't fly out of a slavish fear, but rather because flying is an ordinance of God, opening a door for escape of some, which door is opened by God's providence and the escape countenanced by God's word. If therefore, when thou hast fled and art taken, be not offended at God or man, not at God, for thou art his servant, thy life and thy all are his. And not at man, for he is but God's rod, and was ordained in this to do thee good. 
Hast thou escaped? Laugh. Art thou taken? Laugh. I mean, be pleased which howsoever things shall go, for that the scales are still in God's hands. That's what he's talking about. Now, look at a couple of scriptures with me. We'll come back to Matthew 10 here in a moment. Look at Matthew 21. Matthew 21. Notice with me in verse number 23. When he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? All right, here come the chief priests and the elders. Who are the ones who are going to eventually have him arrested and have him tried and are going to be yelling out, crucify him? Chief priests and the elders. Okay, they're out to get him. Okay. How did Jesus handle that? Notice what he said in verse 24. Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? Well, and they reasoned with themselves saying, if we say from heaven, then he'll say unto us, why did ye then not believe him? But if we say of men, we fear the prophet for all hold, we fear the people, for I'll hold John as a prophet. They answered Jesus and said, We can't tell. And he said to them, Well, neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. And they walk away. You know what that is? Wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. See, I wonder, uh, by what authority do you have to go out and witness? Bless God! We'd tell them where we got our authority. See? And, and, and get ourselves right into trouble. Be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Look over in Matthew 22. Matthew 22. They ask him the question here. Again, the Pharisees took counsel. Verse 15, Matthew 22, verse 15. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with their Rodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Now remember, they're, they're lying to him. When they're saying, oh, you're, 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 you teach the way of God in truth, and we know you're true, and they're calling him master. They don't believe any of that. They're trying to tangle him in his words. They're trying to trip him up. And so they ask him, is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Are we, we supposed to pay taxes to, to Caesar? And notice what Jesus said. He perceived their wickedness. And he said, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. They brought him a penny. He saith unto them, whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. And he saith unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. And when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Over and over again, you'll see it. Jesus is always our example in these things. All right? Now let's look at number three on your paper. And that is the purpose of the saying. What's the purpose of this saying then? Well, remember, the purpose was the, the sending out of the twelve. The sending forth of the twelve. Uh, going out to preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the first thing we see is the priority. Underneath there, the purpose of the saying is the going forth, and it was a priority. In fact, it's priority number one. That we go and preach the gospel. Why is it priority? Because Jesus has commanded us to go. And anything God commands us ought to have top priority. Amen? Anything He commands us ought to have top priority. We, we, it's so easy for us to allow other things to get ahead of what God has commanded us to do. Isn't it? So easy to let other things that He hasn't commanded us to do clutter up and get in the way that we don't get done what He's commanded us to do. Notice, verse 5, These twelve Jesus sent forth and 
What's the next two words, church? Are you with me? Matthew 10, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and, next two words, commanded them. Uh, suggested to them? Huh, no. He commanded them. Not suggestion. It's a mandate. It's not a matter of convenience. It's a matter of a command. It's not a choice. It's a command. Go. That's a priority. Then notice the preaching. The preaching. Verses 7 and 8. He says, As ye go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Oh, they carried a spiritual message. They weren't just going to, to, to be friendly, though they'd be friendly. They weren't just going to, to, to help them physically, though they would help people physically. They would heal people. But that wasn't the main job. The main job was to preach. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. They had a spiritual message. And notice, it's at hand means this is your opportunity. Don't miss your opportunity. John Polabel now. John has health issues. But I'll tell you what John doesn't regret. John Polable never regrets one Sunday. Uh, those Sundays, all those years of getting on a church bus and riding a church bus and picking up boys and girls for Sunday school and seeing boys and girls receive Christ as their Savior. Huh? Now, guess what? You know what? He, that, he had the opportunity and he took it. He used it. Now he doesn't have that opportunity. Hey, this is if you're healthy and you have the ability to walk and talk and get out, now's our opportunity. You don't know when you won't have that opportunity. It's at hand. It, this is opportunity. And if you don't use your spiritual opportunities, you will lose them. You won't get an opportunity anymore. So the preaching. C underneath number three is the possessions. Notice verse 9 and 10. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses nor scrip for your journey neither two coats neither shoes nor yet stays for the workman is worthy of his meat. These are their possessions. You know what the Lord is telling them? You travel light. Travel lightly. Travel frugally. I think what he's trying to tell them is, fellas, you'll keep a loose hold on the things of the world. And if you want to accomplish what God has commanded us to do, we can't get entangled in the things of this world. They, they, they can't mean more to us than obeying the command of God. And so be careful about the possessions. Then notice in verse 11 and 12, the places to witness. He said, Into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And when ye come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. If it not be worthy, let your peace return unto you. In other words, inquire who in it is worthy. Ask some questions. See who's interested. Remember when Paul got the Macedonian call and he came into the city? He didn't find anybody. You know what he did? He asked. Hey, what, you know anybody around here that wants to worship God? Anybody? Oh, there's some women down by the river. And so he went down there. And that's where Lydia got saved. And her house. But he inquired. He asked. Who is it around here? And by the way, it seems like that uh, when she got saved, remember, she invited him to stay at her house. That was it. You didn't, you didn't put people in the motel in those days, you know. It just, you just... Put them in your home. Hospitality. And so uh, inquire, ask who's interested. And, and he's reminding them to use good manners while you're there. Use good manners while you're there. When you're out witnessing and you go into someone else's home, remember it's their home. I've been, I've been in witness someone or get the gospel out and, and I'm in their home. And they'll say, uh, you know, you mind if I smoke? You know what I always say? It's your house. It's your house. No, I'd, I'd rather they don't. But, but it's their house. I'm not going to tell them they can't smoke in their house. And when, 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 if I go in there and the television's on, I don't say, man, what do you got that idiot box on for? We got that television on for anyway. 
I don't, I don't say that. You know what I say? I say, is this your favorite program? Or we'll be able to turn that down a little bit. Huh? And they say, oh, I'm not watching that. I'll just turn it off. I say, oh, okay, great. Okay. It, just, just have some manners and be, be kind. And uh, it, 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 it pays off and it, it works. It's good for each of us to remember that. Amen. E underneath that is the power for the work. The power for the work. Verse 13. He said, well, verse 14, actually, Whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. And verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in that day of judgment than for that city. But also look back at verse number 1. When he called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now power there means both ability and authority. You know, if you're going to heal the sick and cast out devils and raise the dead, it's going to take some power. The power of God. Those are none, none of those are easy tasks to do. But God doesn't just commission us, He empowers us, He enables us to be able to do it. Don't, don't look at somebody who's a witness and say, boy, I wish I had their gift of gab. It has nothing to do with the gift of gab. It has everything to do with being empowered by God. And God empowers those who obey Him. I'm reminded of the, the priests when they had the Ark of the Covenant and they were coming up to the Jordan. The Jordan, from what I understand, uh, the Jordan, when you step into the Jordan, you don't, you don't go ankle deep, knee deep. You know, it, when you step in, you're about six foot deep right there. So he said, remember what he told the priest? He said, when your sole of your feet hits the water, I'll part it. They had to step on the water believing God was going to part that thing. And they went down, they weren't going to go under six foot of water. I don't know whether God took them over above it all and part of the water, whether God just softly put them down. I don't know what he did. But it was, it was faith. And they believe God's power will be present. We go out. That's why Jesus said before Matthew 28 with the Great Commission, where he said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. You know what he said right before that? All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. When you go out with the express purpose of giving the gospel to people, when you take it some tracks and you're going out to try to witness to folks, you're going out in God's power. He will enable you. He will cause people to listen to you who won't listen to anyone else. And you won't be able to explain it. And they don't know why they listen to you. That's the power of God. That's the power of God. He still enables people today if we'll obey Him. Then lastly, F is the persecution. This is what this all comes down to, the persecution. As sheep among wolves, verse 16. I send you forth as sheep among wolves. When you look down a little further in verse 22, He says, Ye shall be hated of all men for My name's sake. In verse number 23, when they, but when they persecute you in this city, flee ye to another. They will hate you. They will persecute you. He said it's, it's, it's that persecution is, is, not, just, is not just the uh, outward persecution or we think someone's going to stone us or someone's going to uh, outwardly. It's just, uh, it can just be outside pressure. And by the way, sometimes the persecution come from other Christians. Convincing you, yeah, you don't need to do that. You don't need to do that to be a good Christian. You don't need to go out and give tracts and tell somebody about Jesus. Yeah, yeah you really do. Because God said so. Jesus has commanded us to do so. And there'll be opposition. But every time he spoke of sending them out, he spoke of persecution. And they, they endured it. And they understood it because they expected it. And they reminded that there will be divine judgment upon the people who persecute them. In fact, Jesus said this, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for those folks. That's an amazing statement. 
And what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah again? Yeah, fire and brimstone. Oh, I like those fire and brimstone preachers. You better like those fire and brimstone preachers. Or you may experience it someday. That's what the Lord's saying. Be, we ought to use cautions, caution, because we're wise as serpents and harmless as doves. How do we react to being persecuted? Wise as serpents, harmless as doves. We're as sheep in the midst of wolves. You don't have to look to be a martyr. Okay? I, I remember college, you do a lot of things. that In college, you have a lot of zeal. You don't have a lot of knowledge. And we were, oh, I think I was 19 years old. You know, and you read, you read these books of these great men of God and how, you know, they, they pray for somebody and, you know, the power of God comes down and they, they repent and get saved and all that. And I remember I was out with another fellow. We were in a rural area in South Carolina and, and we had had a, a woman get saved and we were, went back to see her and talk to her and her children and her husband didn't want anything to do with her. Didn't want anything to do with her. And while we were there on that Saturday, her children were there and she was there and we were talking to her, her husband came. And he walked in, and he did not want us to be there. He said, I'm going to give you, he says, I'm going to give you just, I, I forget how many minutes, it was a minute or two to get out, get out of, get off my property. Well, you know, Brother Chuck, we're going to pray this guy into the kingdom of God. You know what I mean? We, seriously, we got on our knees right in the living room. We started praying. In the bedroom, we could hear the, <laughs> he was clicking his shotgun, man. I'm not kidding you. And when he walked out of the bedroom with his shotgun, we felt a sudden urge to leave. <laughs> and he probably laughed at two 19-year-old preacher boys running off his property to our car and got out of there. Uh, we weren't looking for martyrdom at that point. Don't, God is, God is saying, don't ever, when, when there's persecution, when there's outside pressure or somebody attacks you, listen, don't sink to their level. Don't ever get in a shouting match with somebody. Don't get in arguments. Don't become unholy in your methods or unholy in your association. Perse persecution uh, can come. Don't let it hurt you. Don't, don't take it personally. Harmless as a dove. Innocent, pure, sincere. The dove is also a symbol of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. When Jesus was baptized, the Spirit of God descending on him in the form of a dove. And don't, don't ever forget, you need his filling to do his work. I pray often on Saturdays and other days when we go out to witness that, that Lord, help Help me to do your work in the way you'd want it to be done. I believe there's a way God wants his work to be done. And I think that way would be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. May God help us to have that combination. As we go about the most important work that he's called us to do, and that's to give the gospel to others. Amen? Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for your teaching, your followers, your disciples here as you sent them out. And Lord, we've learned from it tonight. And I pray, Lord, that each of us, as we endeavor to, as we go to preach the gospel, that we would take these admonitions seriously. And this exhortation to be wise as serpent and harmless as a dove. But Lord, you would help us to be effective as we preach the gospel to every creature. Help us to know how to handle those who are interested and how to handle those who are not interested. But Lord, I pray that we would all do your work in the way you'd want it to be done. Lord, we love you. Dismiss us now with your care. Be with those, Lord, who are unable with us tonight. They're sick. They're under the weather. Please strengthen them. Please heal them. Bring them back to us by the Lord's day. 
Dismiss us now with your care. Make us mindful you go with us from this place. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. And I assume there's no choir practice without a piano player. <laughs> a little rough to do that one. And uh, all right. Let's sing the windows of heaven are open. Ready? The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy. That's why you're happy. And that's why we're happy tonight. God bless you. You are dismissed.